connecting. I, I need to talk it through folks, so please bear with me. I've only done this a couple times. Um, I'm sharing to a group and we're calling this the Cultivating Voices. Oh yeah, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Sandy Unone. Good day, good evening. Buenos dias, buenos noches. And welcome to Cultivating Voices Live Poetry Open Mic. I'm your host, Sandy Unone. I'm the author of the book, Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. And I'm thrilled to be with you for our unbelievably 15th continuous week of live poetry readings from around the world. This edition marks, however, our first live poetry open mic using Zoom to Facebook Live. We utilized this platform last week for our ep on, to epic scales for our marathon live poetry pride parade. Thanks to all who participated, our readers, our poetry paraders, our parade attendees, and our parade security. Um, particularly a shout out to Don Krieger and Elizabeth Ann. Well, today marks what seems like a very, very long journey through continued difficult times, but the common thing that we have shared together each week is our humanity, our bearing witness, and speaking our experience through poetry. I was talking briefly with our readers early, a little earlier, saying that it is certainly what has sustained me during these 15 weeks. Therefore, it only seems fitting that our first reader today was our very first reader back to launch our first reading on Sunday, March 29th. If you were with us then, I was coming to you from Missoula, Montana, where I was in isolation, but today I join you from my home here in Olympia, Washington. So without further ado, let me introduce our first four readers who will read in the order that I share their bios. I'll then return to introduce our final four readers at the halfway point of the reading. We're here in Zoom land and you're watching from Facebook where you can comment in the chat function and check out our poet's bios for information about where to purchase those who have books, where to purchase their books, and to support their presses, which again is so important. So if you're able, please commit to purchasing at least one book today as a way to tip our reading series and thank our readers who give us their time and their incredible poetry and art without compensation. Our first reader today is Patrick Dixon, who is a longtime Olympia Poetry Network board member and an enthusiastic performer as a Fisher poet. And the definition is poets in the United States and perhaps elsewhere who have connections with the fishing and cannery industry. And I happen to know that Pat's gonna share some of those poems today. Again, he was our very first reader in our first CV Live open mic on the 29th of March. Our next reader will be Josephine Loray who is a pearl in this diamond world. I, there is no better way to describe Josephine true to form. She is a Calgary-based COVID-bound poet whose work has been published in literary journals and anthologies in Canada, the US, England, Japan, India, China, and Wales. She has published two collections, Unity and the Cowichan series, and has twice been poet in the prow. She has an MA in comparative literature from the Université de Rouen and a BA in modern languages and literature from the University of Toronto. Next, just north of here, coming to us from Tacoma, is Tristan Beach, who is a graduate of Goddard College's MFA in writing program. 
Tristan is the poetry editor of Fifth Magazine and a co-founder of Seattle's Holyoke Reading and Open Mic series. Tristan's poems, commentary, and reviews have appeared in Piff, The Writer in the World, um, Shanty, Conanum Review, Raw Boned, and Pitkin Review. And to close out our first set for today, we have Phil Lynch, who lives in Dublin. His poetry collection, In a Changing Light, is from Salmon Poetry and was published in 2016. He won the 2018 Intercompetitive Poetry Competition, which is an audience voted live performance. That's no small thing to have accomplished. And Phil was a former runner up in the I Yates Poetry Competition and shortlisted in a number of others. He's a regular performer of poetry, spoken word events and festivals in Ireland and has performed at events in the US, UK, Belgium and France. And so without further ado, let me introduce to you all my very good friend, Pat Dixon, our first reader. Thanks for being here and enjoy our first set of poetry, friends. Thank you, Sandy. And I'd like to thank Beth too, your, your sister who helps get um, this all uh, underway. It's, it really is amazing that it was 15 weeks ago. Um, I, I didn't realize it was, that, it was that long. It feels like it was just a few, few weeks ago. So. Um, unlike so many things during this COVID uh, crazy, craziness. Um, I'm, I've, I've been working for the last two months on a uh, memoir of my commercial fishing days and, um, and actually put the final touches on it. Um, I'm sure there's going to be more, way more editing, but I put on the first, first draft that's um, going to be sent out to beta readers uh, here probably later today. I finished it yesterday, July 4th. And, um, and so I was thinking about um, what to read to, today and I decided I would read some fishing poetry because the, the memoir has some of these poems in it. And this one seemed a, a good one to start with. It's entitled, um, Some Fourth of Julys. Some Fourth of Julys found us rafted up in Snug Harbor, drinking Cuervo and beer, cooking crab caught on rings over the side and hoping the weather held through the next fishing period. War was the furthest thing from our minds. In those days, the first Gulf War hadn't happened yet, and far from newspapers, television, and radio was why we were there at all. Emery would arrange to have a keg delivered by float plane. He'd throw it on a cart, tow it up the beach with a four-wheeler, and drop it into a hole filled with cannery ice near a pile of pallets the size of a set net skiff. We'd head to shore for showers at the cannery and the faint hope a good looking deckhand might be available this year. We'd write, light the bonfire in the dim light of a midsummer Alaskan evening. No one cared if you were Republican or Democrat. Only Emery was upset if you fished for another outfit and were drinking his company beer. But if you were dry, there was always someone drunk enough to sneak you a cup. The boats with kids on them would launch bottle rockets and some asshole would toss firecrackers into the fire. We'd all jump and laugh and raise our cups. Though I can't recall anyone saying it, it was the 4th of July all right and standing on the shores of a wild land far from the cares of politics and civilization, we were all about celebrating our freedom. Until one year, as the fire burned low and people drifted toward their bunks, a few of us lingered, not wanting the night to end. A fisherman named Harold stood on the deck of the boat he'd run on to the gravel beach and opened fire at the sky with an automatic rifle. Some people said later it was an Uzi. I don't know if it was, but we, knew, but we all jumped as it belched flames three feet long into the black night and sent hundreds of sleeping kittiwakes screaming into the sky. The sound was such a surprise and the light was so bright, no one thought about the bullets. It was a long moment inside that noise. When it ended, our eyes ached and our ears rang. 
Harold yelled something muffled and strutted into his cabin. The rest of us stood there and tried to understand what we'd just seen. Jesus, said a voice next to me. I thought for a long time about the fact that somebody actually had a machine gun in his boat on the fishing grounds. The bonfires and the kegs stopped after that. The wars hadn't even started. So yeah, I, I was a commercial fisherman in Alaska for 20 years and I lived in Kenai um, for um, 23 years. And I, in the wintertime, I, I taught school, taught at a, a middle school and a high school while I was there. Everything from special education to, uh, to photography. In fact, the photo behind me is, was taken in Snug Harbor. And so this um, actually is uh, currently the title piece for the memoir I'm writing. It's called uh, Waiting to Deliver, and it's my most recent um, Fisher poem. Waiting to Deliver. On the good day, when boats return home, low in the water, holds full, nets wrapped around salmon, rolled on the reel, after picking half the net and laying it back out while the fish keep hitting, then running to the other end and doing it again all day long, no time for breaks, a sandwich or even water, your face, beard, and glasses streaked black by gurry, dotted white with scales, back aching, fingers and wrists sore. You find energy reserves, threads of adrenaline buried deep sustain you till you've made the run home and toss a line to the boat you tie behind, the last of a dozen hanging off the port stern next to a matching group tied to the starboard side of a tender taking fish anchored in the middle of the river. This day of donkey work, this day of absolution, isn't over, won't be for hours. At the back of the queue, you know you'll be here past dinner, past dark, maybe past dawn. You'll eat a baked potato and a red salmon garnished with lemon, onion, and butter less than two hours from the time you plucked it alive from the sea. You'll wash it down with a cold beer from the cooler, watch the sunset, and think how this is the best, most complete life you can imagine. Salt air cools and sh as shadows lengthen, and the water changes from blue to black. You trade bunk time with your deckhand and fall asleep before your head hits the pillow. The smack of a boat hook on the bow wakes you both as the next boat in line cuts you all loose to go deliver. And those of you still tethered together like a serpent in the glare of arc lights work to move up, fighting the current pulled and yanked off course by boats fore and aft, bumping throttles forward, neutral, reverse, trying not to ram the one ahead of you, hoping the one behind you does the same. Your deckhand fends off as you swing too close to the vessels sleeping to starboard until the lead boat tosses a line around the tender's cleat again and you all slide back in the current like a sigh. Engine after engine goes silent. Lines creak around the cleats as they stretch taut. Your crew slips into the bunk while you settle back in the skipper's chair, light a smoke, and sip a cold cup of coffee. You're still waiting, waiting to deliver. So that's, uh, yeah, that's that one. And, um, and then I have just one more. Um, this one is for a couple of friends of mine who have passed away um, and uh, it was pretty self-explanatory. It's called Overboard. It was a cannery truck we said afterward. Unreliable. It wouldn't stall when he slowed down. He probably coasted through the stop sign. Bone cancer doesn't relent, the doctors told her. Go, live, enjoy the time you have left. For five years, she did exactly that. Dove the Great Barrier Wheat Reef, went to China, fished the lake, behind her cabin with her niece. 
When she was done, she slipped away overnight. It doesn't take much. A gentle roll of the boat as the wake passes, the brush of an elbow and the power drill set too close to the edge, tips and tumbles overboard. You see it roll, watch without moving, frozen in a dream. It doesn't even complete a full circle before it hits the water, that flashlight or 10 inch crescent wrench or your cell phone slipping out of your pocket as you bend down in the air before you know it. It lands on the water's surface like you land on the bed after a long day, blankets fluffing, rising as they are displaced, absorbing the impact and falling back again. Only the water receives and moves aside. And your knife, the one you spent all those seasons sharpening, the one you got in France years ago on vacation, a gift from the vendor who loved that you were a commercial fisherman and insisted that you take it, is suddenly out of reach, beneath the surface, fading, getting smaller and dimmer as it recedes from you and all your memories of it, out of your grasp forever, in an instant. Like your friend who tipped over the edge after the struggle to hang on to the rail while the disease rolled under her, or the buddy who was brushed away in the morning light when a car crested the hill and elbowed him into the air before he knew it, a short fall into deep water. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Sandy and Beth, for doing this. This is an awesome, um, awesome event, and I'm glad to be part of it. So, all right. Oh, that was beautiful, Patrick. Thank you very much. I wanted to start off by wishing all of um, my friends, North and South of us, I guess, in the States, a happy birthday, happy July the 4th. And I was going to read something from Michael Andaje, the cinnamon peeler, but I thought I would read Billy Collins instead, who is one of my, one of my many loved American poets. And this one is called Japan. Today, I passed the time reading a favorite haiku, saying the few words over and over. It feels like eating the same small, perfect grape again and again. I walk through the house, reciting it, and leave its letters falling through the air of every room. I stand by the big silence of the piano and say it. I say it in front of a painting of the sea. I tap out its rhythm on an empty shelf. I listen to myself saying it, then I say it without listening. Then I hear it without saying it. And when the dog looks up at me, I kneel down on the floor and whisper it into each of his long white ears. It's the one about the one ton temple bell with the moth sleeping on its surface. And every time I say it, I feel the excruciating pressure of the moth on the surface of the iron bell. When I say it at the window, the bell is the world, and I am the moth resting there. When I say it into the mirror, I am the heavy bell, and the moth is life with its papery wings. And later, when I say it to you in the dark, you are the bell, and I am the tongue of the bell ringing you. And the moth has flown from its line and moves like a hinge in the air above our bed. Again, that is Billy Collins from this collection, Sailing Ar Alone Around the Room. Um, I would like to... You muted yourself. Thank you. The poem is called Light a Candle. I rode my bicycle once to the cemetery to visit you, Nonno, but you weren't really there, 
in a box in the wall, dull plaque, smile set, your face square, your gray hair, candle and red glass votive. When you died, we laid you to rest under open skies, Mount Pleasant, the same place as Tsarita and Lozuramonno before you, she puckered toothless, he filling the days carving duck head handles for a cane. Sanucha was there too, but in a different section, for she had taken her own life. And babies, lots of babies, my sisters and I wandered, read aloud the names and dates on grave markers, time gnawing away at the letters and the numbers, while Papa, on his knees, trimmed the grass around your plaque with scissors brought from home, and Mama rubbed the metal brass so bright. Papa poured brackish water from the vase, added flowers fresh, lit the votive red. We visited you every Sunday, Nonno, and I wonder now, had I lain on sun-warm grass, would I have felt your heartbeat in your chest, heard your laughter bright, seen again the wolves and doves you shadow onto walls, the orange zigzag teeth you carve, watch you play again, fingers tapping tabletop, two fingers, four. I forget now how to play that game. I don't visit you that often anymore since moving to this jagged place where prairies crawl up to the knees of mountains, a place you'll never see. And to tell the truth, I never could really picture you in that box in a wall. I don't recall the year, but they moved you from Mount Pleasant to that mausoleum. Flowers plastic, sad as the face of the Madonna. For back in Sicily, cemeteries are like that, not enough space for the dead. I think of you this Sunday morning, your olive coral flesh, your wide fingered hands, your breath warm as your smile, secure in your arms as you pointed out apple buds swelling in the tree, lifted leaves to show me tomatoes greening on the vine, held me up to La Vigna, grapes growing in our own backyard, offered me tendrils, tangy sweet, told me stories of Sicilia, laughter soft as the rough stubble of your cheek upon mine. I think of you under blue skies, nonno, grass eternal green, and light a candle to your memory, votive red. The next poem I wrote uh, within the past weeks, and I think I'm still tweaking it, but it's an ode to my garden. I continue to plant until my garden contains every known shade of green, from deep spruce, which harbors evening beer, to silver gray wolf willow spray, from translucent lilac just before bloom to the prickle of nettle, from the tremble of columnar poplar to clover taking purchase in the grass. I will learn all the common names and the Latin names rooted in Greek, golden splash, euonymous, pleasant sounding, Lobelia to Gypsophila, Linum to Creeping Lamium, Lilium, Allium, Alyssum, Helichrysum, a litany of blossoms. Flowers for insects and flowers for birds. Armeria, Paeonia, Blue Bee Delphinia, Verbena, Campanula. Petals in a panoply of color Petunia rampant rose, Bahia blue bacopa, and splash red hypoestes, coleus and creeping purple thymus, Dracaena, Artemisia, fuchsia. From sun worshippers to shadow lovers, maidenhair and ostrich fern, Convalaria majalis, that is, lily of the valley, Muguet, in any language, that first whiff of dappled spring. From ground creepers to the celestial, lavande papillon, butterfly lavender ready to take flight, lavatira, celosia, blooms whose words can cast a spell, primula auricula, scabiosa, argentea variegate, cosmos sonata, 
the Centra Spectabilis, known in French as Coeur de Marie, Mary's heart bleeding for her dying son, the sacramental metal sweet bridal veil, then off to faraway lands, Maltese cross, Spirea japonica, Iris siberica, lemon cypress, nanking cherry, and in a pot, the baby monkey puzzle tree for another year or three. Anemone sprung from the mix of Venus's tears and the blood of her mortal lover, Adonis, whom she did implore not to go hunt boar to no avail. The epic and the commonplace, Johnny Jump Up's Petite Pensée, Daylilies and Hardy Roses named for explorers of Canada's harshest climes. The Frobisher, the Baffin, the Franklin, the Rugosas. Never more may I plant a rose lacking scent or thorn for a rose by any other name. And I will take their little tags, pictures printed on plastic out of the box to play with and arrange on my down comforter during the drawn out sun starved months when this land surrenders to the gods of hoar and frost and holds its frigid breath until prairie crocus pokes its head through fields of snow once more. Thank you. And my thanks to all of you. Happy Sunday. Hi everyone, how are we all doing today, uh, this afternoon, this evening? Can you all hear me? Good. Glad to see all those thumbs up. I'm going to uh, read a few poems. Um, and uh, I'll start us off with a uh, haibun by Basho. And this will give you an idea of what a haibun is. Here, three generations of the Fujiwara clan passed as though in a dream. The great outer gates lay in ruins where Hirahira's manor stood, rice fields grew. Only Mount Kinke remained. I climbed the hill where Yoshitsune died. I saw the Kitakami, a broad stream flowing down to the Nambu Plain, the Koromo River circling Izumi Castle below the hill before joining the Kitakami. The ancient ruins of Yashuhira from the end of the golden era lie out beyond the Koromo barrier where they stood guard against the Ainu people. The faithful elite remained bound to the castle for all their valor reduced to ordinary grass. Sufu wrote, the whole country devastated, only mountains and rivers remain. In springtime at the ruined castle, the grass is always green. We sat a while, our hats for a seat, seeing it all through tears. Summer grasses, all that remains of great soldiers' imperial dreams. So the haibun is a uh, hybrid form, actually. It's a combination of prose and uh, haiku, and that's generally what uh, distinguishes the haibun from other uh, types of prose poems is that integration of a haiku, typically at the end. And so uh, I wrote uh, a few haiku and I wanted to share one with you um, today. And this one is called Bauto Sunday, ending at seven pizza bar. We live in a city where a black lake is purported to be. Though none of us has seen it, and only some of us have heard of it, those of us who scale the great firewall. 
and we live under a word cloud of comparisons from east to west, sipping sweetened espresso in one of the Starbucks along Gangtie Street, the one Starbucks behind this marble statue of Mao Zedong. And we walked beside the canal where eight people drowned this past summer, where I once walked it frozen in winter on foot, crossing the white blue-veined ice sheet whose fringes were purpled and green from chemical waste. And we watched the sky crowd over with pale smog, the street lights dampen in the coal smoke of cooking fires, while somewhere quite close the stench of burning garlic and the roar of evening traffic garble the loudspeaker's call to prayer from a nearby mosque. Splitting the moon is a neighborhood specialty. Peking duck pizza. Thank you. So the uh, haiku at the end, uh, I was uh, hoping to make it a bit of a subversion. Um, the sense of uh, uh, an almost absurd uh, confluence of, of different um, ideas and, and forces brought together in one place, um, encapsulated in the idea of a Peking duck pizza, which is basically a pizza made out of Peking duck. Um, it was really, really good, by the way. I lived in Bauto for more than two years, and so um, I wanted to uh, write something that would um, capture both the um, contradictory spirits of the place, but also the sense of uh, um, mundaneness. It, it is uh, uh, very much a city that's located on the plains. This next poem is entitled, My Father's Kiss. And this poem I've been writing for about 10 years now. And in its current shape, it is a sonnet. So we'll see how well it, uh, it sounds off. Your mouth leaves a shape, a violet cave whose walls bear an ancient constellation of pain, telling me you were never whole these 20 years. Now you are here, but this body isn't yours. Not the you who taught me how to dress wounds, like this moment undressed to fill this poem. This poem that is a wound that presses the mouth of another wound. Yet this is a body that once held me, as it once held breath, holding the soul, spirit, dream, whatever that was that was you making the heart murmur through it all to keep us going, breast beat by breast beat, cold, quiet lack at my kiss. So that was uh, my father's kiss. Now this next poem is uh, inspired by another poem by um, Louise Gluck and Instead of reading the entire poem, because it's uh, slightly longer, I'll read uh, a little bit of the Gluck poem to give you a uh, sense of um, the feeling and the, uh, the rhythm of the language. And this is from The Wild Iris. And this poem, by the way, uh, has been marked quite a bit, loved by multiple readers. I am the current owner of this collection, so I've added my own markings to it. The wild iris. At the end of my suffering, there was a door. Hear me out. That which you call death, I remember. Overhead, noises, branches of the pine shifting, then nothing. The weak sun flickered over the dry surface. It is terrible to survive as consciousness buried in the dark earth. And my poem is called The Door, after Louise Gluck. You imagine it a membrane that we pass as fog, entering a low town where we press into each other with our mass. But then you think 
there must be some other place, as at a river where the dead can speak, touching the waters, paring the reed stalks with their beaks. But once you do pass, the door breaks, your soul like yoke, spilling across the black. Then you, learning there had only been this one habitation, hover near your children, grown up at once in this small white room, sitting together, though none touches the other. And uh, this final poem is uh, my most recent one, which I've written uh, in quarantine, and it's called Edna's Figs. So two points if you can figure out the reference there. And this one is also a sonnet, by the way. The priest leaves a sack of figs on my porch. I bring them into my kitchen, wash them with soap, and under warm running water, I consider the limits of the fig, whether what I do will kill the virus, and if this act will make me good. Tonight, these figs save no one, but they will add to what is here on the cutting board. I will savor them, skin and all, investigate their greenness, divulge their flesh. I won't leave anything behind except the shadow of their juice, like a handprint on the board seeping into the grain to shelter with fibers that carry the trauma of harvest. Thank you all very much. It was a pleasure having you as my audience. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening, good day, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, thank you very much. It's great to be back on the Cultivating Voices uh, event again. And thanks very much to Sandy and Elizabeth Ann for organizing us and keeping us going. So I'm going to do, I am made an effort not to repeat anything I did before. So a few newish ones, uh, short, all short, or fairly short anyway. This first one, I suppose it's a pandemic poem in a sense. Uh, it was written during the time anyway, and it's called Drifters. We are drifters, shifting in shadows of doubt, lost in a landscape of half-withered thought. We talk to everyone and no one. We argue with ourselves about how we got here and why. We fantasize our lives into what we are not because we do not know what we are. It feels good in the moment until the moment passes and we are adrift again in the unsettled space between our state of being and how it will end. Um, the second one is a, a pandemic poem as well, I have to call it that. <coughs> um, it was written in the early stages of, of our lockdown here. Uh, it's called Break in Transmission. Though it was bright, I could see no life. I could hear no child. The stillness disturbed me. No sound of kisses on cheeks or lips. No jet streams to follow in dreams of exotic locations. Streets unhealthily quiet. Hedges and trees in freeze frame shock. Even the breeze stayed at bay, afraid to touch anything with its breath. Sparky ads still running on radio and TV for events and services long since canceled or put on hold. New words in vogue that pull us together while we keep apart. Our lives measured not in riches, but in essentials and in meters of distance. Cocooners in the wait for wings, ready to flutter from winter to summer. Um, yeah, this next one is a, 
newish as well, but <coughs> not to do with the pandemic. It's a sonnet form as well. It's, um, I suppose it's born of the idea that um, while some people may think they know everything about everything, truth is none of us can, um, but there are things around us that know a lot more and are a lot wiser than us and have been around a lot longer. So um, um, it's kind of to learn from them and uh, to reproduce things that can cohabit with nature and ourselves. It's called whispers. I can only speak of what is in me. The rest I must assemble and diffuse. A blackbird parks and sings its song for me. Bright daffodils roll back the dark for me. Wise oak trees sift the air to let me breed. Fresh dew relieves the morning thirst in me. All these the food for roots that form in me, the words I mould and whisper to the breeze, which takes my thoughts to places out of reach to seep through sand into the depths of seas and rise to rest upon a better beach, to bloom anew with nectar sweet for bees. I am in them if I am anything. And stars, the stars are real in everything. Um, I'm dipping back to my collection, which is probably backways. I didn't get to do the, the, the switch around. Um, and it's uh, in a changing life, Salmon Poetry, uh, 2016. Uh, I wanted to, because of the weekend that's in it, I thought I should do something that has a reference, at least a tenuous connection with the US. Um, um, I had a few options, but I chose this one, which is um, actually written about 50 years ago, I shudder as I say that, um, but it was just after the first moon landing. Not sure if anybody else on here um, <clears throat> remembers that, but uh, but the reason I do it and the reason I, I, I uh, reveal the, the date of it is because um, it was written as a futuristic piece at the time um, when uh, China was perceived, of course, as the, the big threat uh, coming across the horizon to the West. And um, some of the things that weren't commonplace at the time, like computers, modern systems of telecommunications, uh, space travel, especially civilian space travel, they were all in their infancy and many of them still are. Uh, so I maintain that it's still a bit futuristic, this, so that's why I keep hanging on to it. So bear in mind, written 50 years ago. So Progress. The main course is finished. The family proceeds to the orchard. For dessert, they eat the ripening fruit from the trees. Beneath them, the 2 p.m. train streaks through. Father rushes to his private plane, shouting, I'm late. I won't be over the TV controls, he calls. I won't be home for tea, dear. He is flying to Peking for an important meeting with the lunar ambassador to discuss business prospects. The 6 p.m. flight from Cape Mao, formerly named Cape Kennedy, is delayed because of a dust storm in Moon Se Ho. Due to the extended strike by computers, concern continues to grow in New York as to the amount of food left in their storeroom one, a quiet place once called the British Isles, but uninhabited since the afternoon of the last war. Latest reports say the minor famine in Europe is easing. Only two million have died since noon. Meanwhile, the building up of the planets proceeds, the plan being to inhabit the latter and to recultivate the entire earth. This may be somewhat delayed by the forthcoming war, expected to decrease the population by half. Nevertheless, the great universal progress continues. Um, so time-wise, yeah, I think that's been a bit deeper side. So this is a little rhyme <coughs> I wrote. It's um, poetry uh, is often talked about in some quarters in a way that uh, I think only tends to alienate people from it. And maybe that's the, I wonder if that's maybe the intention sometimes, but uh, 
it, it does have that effect. And uh, so people are not inclined to embrace it, and not to mention think about writing or reciting it. So with a little tongue in cheek, I wrote this. It's called I Like Poetry. I like the P in poetry. It relieves and comforts me, the P. Without it, we would have poetry. That wouldn't quite do it, you see. I like the O in poetry too. It opens up such wondrous sounds around to let the others through. How dull if O was out of bounds. I like the E in poetry. Yes, soft and strong, it's doubly blessed. Without it, beats could be a mess. Sometimes I think it is the best. The T in poetry does poet make, and poery sounds a little weak. It may be flat, but no mistake, the T is used to twist and tweak. The R has surely earned its place. It protects us from being poety faced. It would truly be a great disgrace were our R to be erased. The why, oh my, it so completes it. But all the questions that arise, how, if why should be deleted, could we ever ask all those whys? Okay, time is catching. So I think actually, uh, talked a little bit too much, so I'll just finish this very, very short little one, and it's called Kindling. Set a fire, strike a match. When it catches, fan the flames. Let it burn, spread the ashes. Gather twigs, start again. Thank you very much for listening, folks, and thanks again to Sandy and Elizabeth Ann. Enjoy the rest of the evening. I'm looking forward to it. Bye. Thank you so much, Phil, who's joined us from Dublin, where it's now approaching the nine o'clock hour in the evening. Appreciate you being with us tonight. And, and to all our readers, Tristan, Josephine, and Patrick, uh, in different time zones. Well, we're, for our next set, um, I'd like to just remind you that 